I give you once again Timothy Brock. Thank you, Clay. So, um, we're about to see one of really Chaplin's three big masterpieces, uh, which is considered City Light and The Gold Rush and Modern Times. Um, you have to remember that sound came in 1927, and Chaplin um, had always intended City Lights, which came out in 1931, to be a silent film. Um, but, you know, that's four years after sound had already come in. No one was making silent films at all. But Chaplin decided that he still felt like that, that the Tramp should make at least one more film. And we're very glad he did, because it's, it's really his masterpiece. So by 1935, which is when they went into production for modern times, now we're getting into really ridiculous territory. Because it is um, a good eight years after sound had already come in. Now, when Charlie went into production in 1935, he actually originally intended it to be a sound film. And in the archives, you'll see actual dialogue, pages of dialogue of the tramp talking. And Paulette Goddard, the Paulette Goddard character of the gammon in, in uh, modern times, um, was, had all these crazy things happening to her. Like she went into the nunnery and um, Charlie was, was supposed to enter in World War I and then came out and then they discovered each other. It was, it was, he was trying to make it sort of a bigger epic than it actually ended up being, which was a great film about the social commentary about, about uh, the worker. Um, and it's one of the reasons that, um, you'll see also because the Charlie's FBI file, which was released about six years ago, um, there's an entire book on modern times and the implications it meant and uh, the you'll you can read the he has a vast FBI file by the time Chaplin was deported in 1954 <clears throat> Now it was a very uh, interesting thing for him to do um, as uh, as a, you know in terms of film history musically Charlie had only written one film score by this time and that's City Lights It's a great film score it's for a kind of a small foxtrot band. It's about 34 players, and that is small in Hollywood terms. Um, and it uses quite a bit of music that would be very contemporary of the day. Um, a lot of a lot of foxtrots, a lot of um, um, orchestrina, as they would call it, type of tunes, uh, including La Valletera, which is written by Jose Padilla. Well, Modern Times was he was so bitten by the music bug that when he decided to make modern times, he thought, I need to make a bigger orchestra. Well, he tripled the size of the orchestra to about 70 players. Okay, that's not triple. My math was not my best subject in West Seattle High School. <laughs> okay, admittedly. Um, however, uh, it was a lot bigger. And as I said in the first part, um, he did everything by trial and error. He wrote like lots of bits of, of music and he would go into the studio and uh, listen to something and change it on the fly. Now, changing it on the fly in Hollywood terms is not exactly the right t phrase to use because on the fly means essentially what, what David Raxon, as you may remember, who's the composer of Laura and some other great f golden age of Hollywood film scores, this was, this was his first job working as Chaplin's musical associate. What that musical associate is, by the way, is the, is the guy who writes down what Chaplin's playing on the violin or on the piano or on the cello. And Chaplin would come into the studio at 9 o'clock every morning on Sunset in La Brea, uh, which, by the way, the, those, stu that, those studios are still there. You'll see exactly the building that Charlie built to this day, which is still there, except it has Kermit the Frog on it now in a, in a Chaplin costume. Um, and in, uh, when Chaplin left the U.S. in 1954, it's where they shot Superman. So, um, in fact, Jack Larson, who's Jimmy Olsen, used to come to every L.A. Chamber Orchestra performance I gave there of, Ch of Chaplin music, and he would bring with him the original wrenches, which he found at the, uh, at the studio. So, anyway, I, I get distracted. I'm supposed to, I'm, I'm trying to make this shorter because we're running a little bit late, but... Um, 
essentially Chaplin would get to the studio at nine o'clock in the morning and he would work on two minutes of the film every day. So he would sit down with David Raxon and play on the piano or on the violin a section of the film that they had in a moviola, which is a viewer of a film that would run forwards and backwards, which makes it easier for him to run little bits of, of music and then play little bits and then see how it looks while David played what he wrote down and then played it back. Anyway, David would make what's known as a short score, which is five lines of what Charlie wrote and said, this, it, you know, this, this is the tune, this is the chord structure. And then he would come back with this five score and then he would sit down with Charlie and orchestrate from that point. So he would sit down and say, okay, this, op this line here, -de -de -ba -ba -de -de -ba, like that, he'd say, that should be oboe. And then the cello's line is this, blah, 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 blah. And then the brass should play this chord, uh, 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 like that. And then David would write all this down. Then he would take that score and then take it home and then orchestrate it for 65 to 70 players. And then from that point, they would have to mimeograph players' parts, make players' parts, mimeograph them all, give them to the players. And once they had enough music collected, which usually is about 10 minutes of music at a time. They give it to the musicians. Charlie would listen to it once and go, no, that's not good. Let's do it again. <laughs> this is why it took six weeks to, rec to record this score. And it took, that's a, that's, that's a lifetime in Hollywood terms. But Charlie would do, play things over and over and over. And we recently got, about five years ago, the acetates, the original acetates, to the Modern Times recording session. And you can hear Alfred Newman swearing up a blue streak <laughs> at Chaplin going, what do you mean that's not good enough? He says, Chaplin's like, no, 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 no. And they're yelling back and forth. I don't know why they kept the record button on. It's very expensive acetate. But they, there's this great documentation of Al, Al Newman getting furious. And in fact, Alfred Newman, uh, no, is David Raxon got, got fired one week after being hired by Chaplin on Modern Times and was sent back to Philadelphia, uh, was, was told to, to go back to Philadelphia. But Alfred Newman stuck up for, for um, uh, David Raxon because David Raxon, who was 23 at the time, actually had enough nerve to say no to Chaplin. It, music wasn't quite good enough. No one says no to Chaplin. But they, in Hollywood, in between <coughs> 1931 and 1954, there was a little club called the Badge of Honor Club, which is all the music associate, musical associates who've been fired by Chaplin. <laughs> and that's every film. Chaplin fired his musical associate at least once on every film up to 1959. So and they had a little club going, which was, I thought, very cute. Um, but anyway, when restoring this score, I had these five boxes that, that nobody had, had seen since 1935, quite dusty. Um, and, but it was, it was a great pleasure to sort of piece everything back together. And it took such a long time, um, which is why the Chaplains gave me two years to do it. Um, but it was worth doing. And we, for up, up to about three years ago, most people have only heard the Modern Times soundtrack from, was from the original recording from 1936. That's how we all knew the film. We saw it, seen it on television, most of us, but sometimes you go into a theater and you see Modern Times, and, and that's an old recording. Now, what's on that recording is about 60% of what's actually on paper. Because if you read the score on paper, you there's all this stuff going on that you have no idea was happening. So the only people that are actually hearing Modern Times, as Charlie heard it in 1936, is the people who came would come to my live performances because I was the only one to be, who was able to conduct this for the first 10 years because it was too difficult um, because I had to do it from memory. Um, so the only people that could actually hear what Charlie actually wrote were the people who came to the live performances. And then we recorded it in Berlin um, and, and in, at least in Europe, uh, it's been re-released cinematically, if you can believe it, in France, all over France. They released it with the new recording that you're about to hear, uh, which is the first time in the U.S. you'll actually hear this recording uh, with this film. Um, so this is a, a recording that we made uh, over uh, um, 10 days' time. Um, and 
that's it. That's all I can think of at the moment. I just tried to wrap that up quickly. I hope you enjoy it. It's Modern Times, 1936. I just have one more thing to say. Tim, Tim, please keep standing. For the Southwest Seattle Historical Society and for West Seattle's Admiral Theater, Tim Brock came tonight to do this out of the goodness of his heart. Can you raise the roof, please, for him before we see this film? Have a good time.